Hello folks and thank you for joining me. Um here it is late or early, depending on your point of view. Twelve thirty and I'm just now starting this. Probably end up going for another couple hours here with this one, hopefully maybe not that long, but we'll see. The last one I had to cut it off at the point I was at because it was just, you know, almost two hours long and and uh I had covered enough for there. However, we're going to actually revisit that one to a degree um, because there was more on Jehovah that needed to be covered in regards to the name game since Jehovah is kind of a controversial aspect of term of the references to the Lord. And may I remind you, and this is part two. And as I said, and if you haven't watched part one, you should probably watch it first. Uh, but um, as I said in that one and, and showed through the definitions of all these words that are used uh, to in place of God's name, none of them are the actual name of God, of the creator, or even of any individual lower gods okay they're all simply references to the name of God in place of his name because of basically the real name of God the creator God um, if it was ever told to any man at all was lost to antiquity through the wiping of his name uh, mainly through the Jewish sect of uh, being afraid of taking the name in vain and violating that commandment so they forbid it to be spoken so none of the words that are used to this day uh, are the actual name of the father now that being said and clarified we will continue where we left off basically um, with a little bit more on the Jehovah or the Jehovah uh, word also, I want to point out also, uh, if you know us, of course, I am only referring to uh, the God of the Bible, the God, the Judean God, the God of A uh, Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, um, the God of Israel, for instance, uh, another term. Uh, the reason for this in this video series um, it's not due to a religious preference it is due to the fact that uh, this is the only God that seems to come under constant attack whether it be in his heavenly form as the Father or whether it be as the Son and of which we will get into in this second version here too uh, Jesus or Yeshua uh, and the references and names thereof um, are the only God that seem to be coming under attack from any I mean you don't hear somebody come out and say oh Allah Allah that's not God's name that's not Allah, Allah he's a he's a demon or he's a uh, Allah is actually Zeus <laughs> or Allah is actually Aphrodite or, or you know whatever uh, you know it's 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 like uh, you don't hear that you don't hear uh people going around saying Shiva Shiva what are you talking about Shiva's not the destroyer Shiva's actually Thor you know or actually this or actually that you don't hear these other gods of these other religious beliefs and uh, uh, ideologies under attack at any time you don't hear them being twisted you don't hear their stories being twisted you don't hear a constant barrage of deception being put out against them just like you don't hear a constant barrage of destruction of their name or of their reference or of their being as you would in say Christ okay even atheists they don't attack uh, Muslims they don't attack uh, the you know the the India the Indians 
and their beliefs. They don't attack uh, the Chinese and their beliefs. They don't attack Japan and their, you know, they don't attack the dragon gods. They don't attack the Mayans. They don't attack any of these other religious or beliefs referring to God. It's always about Christians or not even just Christians, you know, you know, most of them are too ignorant to know that there's a difference between Christianity and then following Christ. Because most of them have never even read a Bible in the first place, yet they're all out against it. <laughs> yeah, but they've never picked it up themselves. Um, but I'm not going to get into all that ridiculousness. I'm just pointing out the fact that the, the, the one that's always under attack is this God here. Is this and in which in the upper uh, when you're following Christ you're not talking about uh, some lower gods or you're talking about the creator the father of all okay um, and that's what it's referenced to and that's why this is the words and names that we are addressing in this video series is because strictly because they are the ones that are under attack now you can devise for your own reasoning why that is okay I shouldn't have to spell that out to you um, you figure that out for yourself but I'm just saying that's the point of this okay um, and with that said we will continue with a little bit more on Jehovah or Jehovah and going into the pronunciation since it is even compared to Yahweh a more controversial term that has been argued throughout you know the centuries of its proper presentation and uh, proper place in the uh, wording or naming of the Lord so pronunciation most scholars believe Jehovah to be late 11th century um, a hybrid form derived by combining the Latin letters JHVH with the vowels of Adonai but some hold there is evidence that the Jehovah form of the Tetragrammaton may have been in use in Semitic and Greek phonic texts and artifacts from late antiquity Others say it is a pronunciation Yahweh that is testified both Christ, in both Christian and pagan texts of the early Christian era. Now the Karaite Jews as proponents of the rendering Jehovah state that although the original pronunciation of Jehovah has been obscured by disuse of the spoken name or actually Yahweh uh, has been obscured by disuse of the spoken name according to oral rabbinic law well-established English transliterations of other Hebrew personal names are accepted in normal usage such as Joshua Isaiah or Jesus for which the original pronunciations may be unknown they also point out that the English form of Jehovah is quite simply an angelicized form of Yehovah and preserves the four Hebrew consonants YHVH with the introduction of the J sound in English of course some argue that Jehovah is preferable to Yahweh based on their conclusion that the tetragrammaton was likely a trisyllabic originally and a, tr a three syllable word and modern, fo modern forms there should have three syllables. According to Jewish tradition developed in 3rd to 2nd centuries BCE, the Tetragrammaton is written but not pronounced. When read, substitute terms replace the divine name where Yahweh or Adonai appears in the text. It is widely assumed, as proposed by 19th century Hebrew scholar Jacinius, that the vowels of, of the substitutes of the name Adonai, meaning Lord, and Elohim, meaning God, were inserted by the Masorets to indicate that these substitutes were to be used when the uh, Lord or God, Elohim, proceeds or follows Adonai. The Masorets placed the vowel points of Elohim into Tetragrammaton 
producing a different vocalization of the tetragrammaton, which was read as Elohim, or Elohim. Uh, based on this reasoning, and I realize I just pronounced that, but it's El some people pronounce it Elohim, some people pronounce it Elohim. So, okay. Based on this reasoning, the form uh, Jehovah has been characterized by some as a hybrid form and even a philological impossibility. Now, I may have read that in, actually already in the last one, but we're, we're picking up where we were, were. Early modern translators disregarded the practice of reading Adonai or its equivalents in Greek or Latin, Kupiak and Dominus. Uh, in place of the tetragrammaton and ins instead combine the four Hebrew letters of the tetragrammaton with the vowel points that except in synagogue scrolls accompanied them resulting in the form Jehovah this form which first took effect in works dated 1278 and 1303 was adopted in Tyndale's and some other Protestant translations of the Bible in the 1611 King James Version Jehovah occurred seven times in the 1971 American Standard, the form Jehovah became regular English rendering of the Hebrew all throughout, in preference to the previously dominant the Lord, which is generally used in the King James Version. It is also used in Christian hymns, such as the 1771 hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Now, the development most widely spread theory is the Hebrew term uh, has the vowel points of Adonai okay and using the vowels of Adonai um, or Adonai in some cases the composite of the Hatapata under the guttural Alif becomes a Shiva under Yod the Holom is placed over the first He and the Quamats is placed under the Va now giving uh, Jehovah when uh, the two names occur together, the former is ported, pointed with the Hatak Sigol under Yod and uh, the Herik or Hyrik under the second He giving to indicate that it is to be read as Elohim or Elohim in order to avoid Adonai being repeated. So Adonai Elohim or Elohim Adonai, and um, put my cigar out there. Okay, um, the pronunciation Jehovah is believed to have arisen through the introduction of vowels of the cure uh, or the curie, and the marginal notation used by the Masoretes in place in the places where the contents, consonants of, of the text were to be read the kiri differed from the consonants of the written text the kithib, or kithib and they wrote the kiri in the margin to indicate that the kithib was read using valves of the kiri for a few uh, very frequent words the marginal note was admitted referred to as kiri perpetuum now one of these frequent cases was God's name which was not to be pronounced in fear of profaning the ineffable name. Instead, wherever Yahweh appears in the Khatib of the biblical and liturgical, <laughs> it was read to, it was to be read as Adonai, meaning my Lord, or plural of Majesty, um, or as Elohim, meaning God. If Adonai appears next to it, this combination produces Yehovah and Yehovah, respectively. It is also written, or even as read, Hashem, as meaning the name. Scholars are not in total agreement as to why uh, Adonai does not have precisely the same vowel point, or uh, right, why Yehovah does not have precisely the same vowel points as Adonai. The use of the composite Hatif Segol in cases where the name is to be read Elohim has led to the opinion that the composite Hataf Pata ought to have been used to indicate the reading Adonai. It has been argued conversely that the disuse of the Pata is consistent with the Babylonian system in which the composite is uncommon. 
And of course, a personal note, I think they complicate this much too much, and I think they've done it on purpose. Making all this ridiculously and redundant. <coughs> but I move on forward. Thou points of those two Hebrew words there. Um, Elohim and Adonai. Or of Jehovah and Adonai, sorry. The table below shows the bow points of Jehovah and Adonai, indicating the set Shiva, the Shiva in Jehovah, in contrast to the Hatapata in Adonai. As indicated to the right, the vowel points when used when Yahweh's intended to be pronounced as Adonai are slightly different than those used in Adonai itself. Whatever that means. You know, take from it what you will. I really don't know what that even just said, even though I just read it, because it doesn't make any sense what these people have done, other than the fact that they're trying to cover. And uh, it brings into question the superstition of it all. So, introduction into English, though. The Brown Diver Biggs lexicon suggested that the pronunciation Jehovah was unknown until 1520 when it was introduced by Gelatinus, who defended its use. In English, it appeared in William Tyndale's translation of the Pentateuch, or a Pentateuch the Five Books of Moses, published in 1530 in Germany, where Tyndale had studied since 1524, possibly in one or more of the universities at Wittenberg, Wittenberg Worms, and Marburg, where Hebrew was taught. The spelling used by Tyndale was Lohua. At the time, L was not distinguished from or from J and U, and was not distinguished from V. The original 1611 printing of the authorized King James Version used Lehova. Tyndale wrote about the divine name Yahuwah, or Yehovah, Jehovah, is God's name. Neither is any creature so called, and it is as much to say as one that is of himself, and dependeth on nothing, or of nothing. Moreover, as oft as thou seest the Lord in great letters, except that there be er any error in printing, it is in Hebrew, Lahua. Now thou art, or Ehua. Thou art, that thou art, or thou he that is. And uh, that's what that means. Again, that's still not a proper name. It's just in reference to the ineffable, known, ineffable name. The name is also found in 1651 edition, Ramon Matez, uh, Pugio Fidai. Now, the name Jehovah appeared in all early Pro Protestant Bibles in English except Coverdale's translation in 1535. The Roman Catholic Douay Rheims uh, Bible used the Lord, corresponding to the Latin Vulgate's use of Dominus, uh, Latin for Adonai or Lord, to represent the Tetragrammaton. The authorized King James Version, also which uses Jehovah in a few places, most frequently gave the Lord as the equivalent of the Tetragrammaton. Um, the name Jehovah appeared in John Rogers' Matthew Bible in 1537, the Great Bible of uh, 1539, the Geneva Bible of 1516, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, King James Version 1611, more recently has been used in the Revised Version of 1885, in the American Standard Version of 1901, and the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures of the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1961. At Exodus 3, 6, uh, I mean 6, 3 to 6, where King James Version has Jehovah, the revised, you know, uh, the revised Standard Version, the New Standard Version, the New International Version, the New King James Version, and the New Revised Version, and the Century Version, and the Contemporary English Version give Lord, or Lord, as their rendering of the Tetragrammaton. While the New Jerusalem Bible, the Amplified Bible, the New Living Translation, the English Standard Version, and the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Bible, Bible sorry, use the form Yahweh. <coughs> yeah, excuse me for that. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to stick, we're going to skip over the Hebrew vowel points. We're going to go on to proponents of pre-Christian religion real quick. 
uh, the 18th century theologian, theologian John Gill puts forward the arguments of the 17th century Jane, Joannes Buxford, Buxtorf, sorry, to and the others in his writing and dissertation concerning the antiquity of the Hebrew language, letters, vowel points, and accents. He argued for extreme antiquity of their use, rejecting the idea that the vowel points were invented by the Masoretes. Gill presented writings, including the passages of scripture, that he interpreted as supportive of his Jehovah's viewpoint and that the Old Testament must have included vowel points and accents. He claimed that the use of Hebrew boy vowel points of and therefore the na of the name Jehovah is documented before 200 BCE and even back to Adam, citing Jewish tradition that Hebrew was the first language. He argued that throughout his history the Masoretes did not invent the vowel points and accents but that they were delivered to Moses by God at Sinai, citing Kararite authorities, Mordecai, Ben Nisan, Kukazov, or Kukazov, in 1699, and his associates who stated that all our wise men, and I quote, all our wise men with one mouth affirm and profess that the whole law was pointed and accented as it came out of the hands of Moses, the man of God. End quote. The argument between Karaite and Rabbinic Judaism on whether it was lawful to pronounce the name represented by the Tetragrammaton is claimed to show that some copies have always been pointed or vowed and that some copies were not printed with the vowels because of oral law for control of interpretation by some Judeo sects and including non-pointed copies in synagogues. Gill claimed that the pronunciation Jehovah can be traced back to its early historical sources which indicate that the vowel points and or accents were used in their name. Sources Gill claimed uh, supported this view and that supported his view include and it lists some sources here. I'm not going to get into that either. Um, there was now, another thing is, you know, I don't, I don't know what came first, Hebrew or Arabic, okay? Um, and I don't mean Arabic, I mean Aramaic, Aramaic, um, because actually from my understanding of my research and knowledge, uh, Jesus actually spoke quite often, if not most of the time, in Aramaic, not in Hebrew except for when he needed to speak in Hebrew. So, um, and this is one thing that you never find in these arguments. You never really find, you hear reference to Hebrew, you hear reference to Greek, you hear reference to the Latin, and uh, the, all the names and therefore translations or transliterations thereof are in one of those three languages. Yet, uh, nobody ever goes to the Aramaic and uh, I find this curious myself I do not have a explanation for it um, but I find a lot of things that so-called scholars and theologians do uh, quite incredible and, and quite uh, nonsensical um, to sidetrack here for me I'll give an example of modern day I was watching on H2 the other day and there was some show in regards to the Garden of Eden. And some so-called researcher or scientist, you know, and these are all, you know, you've watched History Channel shows. These guys claim to have doctorates and their PhD this and their scientists that and whatever. And, and this is all about where's the Garden of Eden on Earth. And they're trying to find out where it used to be at and using satellite imaging using references from the story they go into the fruit thing and they they go through the idea that it wasn't really an apple and then they say a lot of people say it was the pomegranate and then, then they go there oh it wasn't really that either then they end up on the fig and they're like that would be more uh, becoming of the area the uh, you know talk about the Middle East area and, and Mesopotamia and all that of figs used to grow then blah blah blah, blah. so they're they're relating these stories and it's so childish it's like it's like the Sunday school fables 
that you're taught about you know just like the bearded man in the sky and the, the Roman Catholic uh, blonde hair blue eyed Jesus I mean give me a break yet these are supposed to be PhDs theologians rabbis priests etc etc that are, are talking about this as if it's serious okay and they're sitting here talking about all these references to a metaphorical story for one I mean, most of the people I know that have any inkling of of true spirituality and any bit of research under their belt realize that the the fruit of knowledge of the tree I mean the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not actually a freaking fruit. Okay, but these so called PhDs and, and scientists and ain't figured this out yet and they're actually making whole shows for the public that propagate this childish fable tale and it's no wonder that a lot of people and especially you know atheists and stuff just can't understand or even grasp and they're, they they're, they this is the argument they always bring at us and yet the people behind the scenes that are supposed to be the knowers the uh scri what would be the scribes and pharisees of the back in the day of the modern day the phds and the scientists um are propagating this crap to the public and I just find it uncomprehensible I really do find it un it's almost as uncomprehensible as uh, the people they have on the like the ancient alien shows that are supposedly the experts <laughs> I'm not gonna get started on that either but uh, anyway I think you get my point and it doesn't seem to have changed any at all throughout all the ages here so with that being said we will continue on um, it argues here more about the syllables and the stupid arguing of the uh, properness of the language and, and what that's the part I went to skip in the last of the last one and that's the part we're going to skip now and we're actually going to go over here to a page. This is the Jewish Encyclopedia, unedited full text of the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia. And of course, you can get this at JewishEncyclopedia.com. Um, and it talks about Jehovah here. We're just going to read a little bit of that. The Valley of Jehovah or Jehoshaphat, from a photograph of Bonfils, a mispronunciation introduced by Christian theologians but almost entirely disregarded by the Jews okay and here's a photo of this valley of the Hebrew Yahweh okay the ineffable name of God the tetragrammaton or Shem Ha Mefarash okay this pronunciation is grammatic grammat grammatically impossible it arose through pronouncing the vowels of the Kiri, marginal reading of the Masoretes, Adonai, with the consonants of the Ketib, the text reading, Yahweh. Adonai, the Lord, meaning the Lord, being such, again, Adonai or Adonai was not a god or a person, not even a lesser god. He's not some Greek god. He wasn't some god of myth of the Sumerians or anybody is not. Adonai is not a proper name. It simply means the Lord. Okay? Uh, indistinguishable. So being substituted with one exception wherever Yahweh occurs in the Bible and liturgical, liturgical, liturgical books, Adonai represents the vowel, Shua, the composite, under the guttural, mm, becomes simple under the Holom and Kamas. Now these give the reading Jehovah. Sometimes when the two names occur together, whether it's, you know, like I said, Adonai or Elohim, Elohim, Jehovah or Adonai occur together, the former is pointed with Hatas Hatas under thus Jeho equal Jehovah to indicate that this combination be pronounced Elohim. 
These substitutions of Adonai and Elohim for Yahweh were devised to avoid the profanation of the ineffable name. Hence, it is also written or even read as Hashem, the name. Now, we've read some of this already. This, you know, is pretty much the same as what the other pages were saying in both under Yahweh or Jehovah. The reading Jehovah is a comparatively recent invention. The earlier Christian commentators report that the Tetragrammaton was written but not pronounced by the Jews. Uh, see Theodoret and uh, you know, blah blah blah. I'll give some examples there. Jerome and his letter to Marcellus, where he notices that Pippi is presented in Greek manuscripts. The origin. See Hexpala or Hexapala, Hexapla, and uh, concordance to the LXX, and by Hatch and Rid Bath, under which occasionally takes place of the usual Kopiak in Philo's Bible quotations. Kopiak equals Adonai is the regular translation. See also Aquila. Jehovah is generally held to have been the invention of Pope Leo the Tenth, uh, Confessor Peter Gallatin, D. Arcanus Catholicae Veritatis, who was followed in the use of this hybrid form by Vagius in the Bouclé, and uh, Drusius in the Vanderdrex, and uh, was the first to ascribe to Peter Gallatin. Uh, and the use of Jehovah and this view has been taken since his days um, the Hastings Dictionary Bible uh, the Jacinius Bull uh, Handwerther and uh, see Drusius on the Tetragrammaton in his uh, Critique Sacre uh, which but it seems that even before Galatin the name Jehovah had been in common use see Drusius it is found in Raymond Martin's Pugio Fidei and uh, written 1270 in Paris. Now, T. Pratt in Dictionnaire de la Bible uh, see also the names of God. And we're going to get to some of that too. The pronunciation Jehovah has been defended by Steer or Steyer and Holman. Um, the use of the composite Shua Hata Sigol in cases where Elohim is to be read has led to the opinion that the composite Shua Hatapata or Hatapata uh, ought to have been used to indicate the reading Adonai. It has been argued in reply that the disuse of the Pata is in keeping with the Babylonian system in which the composite Shua is not unusual or not usual. But the reason why the pata is dropped is plainly on the non-guttural character of the yol, or the yod, to indicate the reading Elohim. However, Sigol and Herik under the last syllable, i.e., uh, and it shows the syllable, but I'm not gonna, and had to appear in order to mistake, or in order that a mistake might not be made and Adonai be repeated. Other peculiarities of the pointing are these, with prefixes wa, bet, min. The voweling is that required by Adonai, we Adonai, ba Adonai, mi Adonai. Again, after Yahweh equals Adonai. The Dagish lean is inserted, and which could not be the case if Jehovah, ending in, were the pronunciation. The accent of the cohortative imperatives, which should, therefore, a word like Jehovah be on the first syllable, rests on the second when they stand before, which, in fact, is proof that the Masoretes read Adonai, a word beginning with A. And this goes into the bibliographically references. Um, and, of course, you know, this this is, so the Jewish reject Jehovah as a word, is basically what this is saying. And it, this is trying to explain to you and give the references of the people who back it up, that uh, according to the Jewish language, 
that Jehovah could never be the correct pronunciation. To sum it up, and then they give a bunch of references. And of course, in the comment section, you have people who want to argue with that and say, well, Jeho Jehovah, I believe in Jehovah. <laughs> Whatever. So, be that as it may, let's go to this article here. Who is Jehovah and who is Jesus? And this will be our segue. So, who is Jehovah and who is Jesus? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John first first. Jehovah's Witnesses are well known for their denial of the deity of Christ. According to well, so are Jews. <laughs> I digress, don't I? Here, I'm going to light up my cigar again. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are well known for their denial of the deity of Christ. According to their theology, Jesus was an incarnation of the Supreme Archangel, not God in human flesh. The historical name for this teaching is Arianism. Arius was a 4th century heretic whose doctrine was opposed by Anathesius and condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Arius's doctrine of the Incarnation was virtually identical to that of the modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses. Arius even used many of the same arguments Jehovah's Witnesses employ today. Uh, Athanasius brilliantly responded to Arius and exposed his distortions of Scripture. Athanasius worked Athanasius's work entitled On the Incarnation stands as an effective reply to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And you come to this, this article is uh, www.spurgeon.org and it's a Phil Articles Deity. Uh, you can find it on Google by looking up Jehovah. It's, it's one of the clicks on there. Um, and, and of course it has these links and you can go to the link of the Council of Nicaea uh, to his book, his work entitled On the Incarnation, etc. from these links on this page I imagine. So stands if you want to further this, but this is just a segue like I said as an effective reply to Jehovah's Witnesses. But for the moment let's ignore the writings of Athanasius and uh, the documents of the Nicene Council and every other historical and theological source except scripture itself. Is it possible to demonstrate conclusively from the Bible alone that Jesus Christ is set forth in scripture as God? I believe it is and I am convinced that those who reject Christ's deity uh, must therefore also reject the plain meaning of the Word of God. And at least eight lines of argument combined to make the biblical case for the deity of Christ. 1. The Old Testament predicted a divine Savior. We need only sample a few key passages to make the point. Psalm 2 is the messianic, messianic psalm that was recognized by such Jewish scholars as uh, centuries before Christ. Um, in Acts 13.33, Paul affirms that this psalm has a messias, messianic meaning. The psalm closes with these verses, and I quote, Worship Jehovah with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. End quote. There, the phrases, worship Jehovah, or you can replace that Jehovah with Adonai, Elohim, or Yahweh. They basically all are talking about the same thing. And none of them are a, like I said before, and like we've proven in these readings, are a actual proper name of the Creator or Father himself. Okay, so it's uh, all reference to the Tetragrammaton, and uh, I could actually get into the Tetragrammaton and mathematics and the whole relationship to that, but I'm not going to in this particular reading. 
Uh, we're talking about names here, and only names, not uh, sources as far as what is God. This isn't about what is God. This is about the name game. Okay? So, and do homage to the sun, our parallel. And as is typical in Hebrew poetic parallel, parallelism, this means the two phrases are logical equivalents. Worship Jehovah means to do homage to the sun. Moreover, this psalm presents the Son as someone in whom believers can take refuge, a Savior, who is God's own Son, identical in character and rank with God the Father. It also says in that same phrase, uh, not to be held under his anger. Um, psalm 10 is identified as the Messian Messianic, uh, or Messianic, whatever, psalm by the writer of the Hebrews. Hebrew 5, 6, 7, 17. Here David calls him Lord. And I quote, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. End quote. Jesus himself quoted this verse in Matthew 22, 43 to 45 to demonstrate that he existed before David and was superior to any earthly king. The word translated Lord in that verse does not necessarily designate deity. It is a Hebrew word that often applies to an earthly master. Um, the English used to use it too, you know, all the time, my Lord. Um, it'd be like, yes, my Lord, you know, to the king. and uh, Or even to lesser kings, I mean to the uh, duchess and stuff of, of certain kingdoms if you was a servant. You would address him as my lord. Um, so, uh, so it's only a single piece in the puzzle, but not particularly significant by itself. But when weighed with the rest of the evidence, its full meaning becomes clear. Other messianic prophecies are even more clear in ascribing deity to the Lord's anointed one. Isaiah 9, 6, for example, is clear promise of the Messiah. It gives a string of names that apply to him, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, or Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace, end quote. An earlier prophecy by Isaiah, Isaiah found in Isaiah 7, 14, gave him the name Emmanuel, which literally means God with us, or God is with us. Um, Micah. 5.2 prophecy that the Messiah's birthplace would be Bethlehem and it spoke of him with these profoundly important words and I quote from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel his goings forth are from long ago from the days of eternity end quote in Malachi 3, 1 to 2, we find one of the clearest, most vivid prophecies of the coming Messiah. Mark 1, 2 identifies this verse as the prophecy of Christ. And it says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. The Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. It says the Lord of hosts, who... But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. End quote. Notice that it portrays Jesus as Lord. This is the Hebrew word Adonai, who is coming to his temple. And he is coming to do a work of divine judgment. Jesus is called Jehovah. At this point, well-trained Jehovah's Witnesses would want to make a distinction between the word Adonai, which is translated Lord in most English Bibles, and the word Jehovah or Yahweh, as also translated Lord in most English Bibles. If you want to tell the difference between the words in most translations, when the original is Adonai, the word Lord, will appear in capital and lowercase letters. When the Hebrew word Jehovah of the word Lord will appear in capital and small capital letters. Let's suppose our hypothetical Jehovah's Witnesses points out that in all the verses I have cited so far, the word Adonai has been employed, not Jehovah. Since um, since the Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jehovah is the one true name of God, 
any passages that apply the term Jehovah to Christ would conclusively destroy their entire theology. Are there any such verses? There certainly are. Psalm 23, 20, uh, 23, 1, for example, says, Jehovah is my shepherd. Jesus very clearly applied this passage to himself in John 10, 11 to 14, when he said, I am the good shepherd. And the writer of the Hebrews also applied this passage to Christ in Hebrews 13 to 20, when he wrote, The God of peace brought up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, Jesus our Jehovah. In Isaiah 6, 5, when Isaiah saw this, his vision of heaven with the Lord high and lifted up, he said, and I quote, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, or the Lord of hosts. End quote. Yet the Apostle John, referring to the same incident, writes that Isaiah saw Christ's glory, and he spoke of him. And you also have in another uh, reference in the scripture where the demons actually recognize Christ as the Lord, God, hosts. Um, in the famous prophecy of John the Baptist found in Isaiah 43, 40, part 3, verse 3, um, Jesus is called Jehovah, and I quote, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord, or Jehovah, in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. End quote. And that's John the Baptist. And uh, in, in Jeremiah 23, 5-6, a very crucial text for the doctrine of justification by the faith, or by faith, this verse introduces the new name for God, Jehovah, Sik Sikinu, or I can't even pronounce that, but I'm going to say it's a silent T. I'm going to say uh, uh, Sikinu. Sure. Jehovah, and I quote again, Jehovah our righteousness. Notice to whom it is applied. And I quote, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, or Jehovah, when I shall rise up for David's, for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. This is very clearly a messianic, pro messianic prophecy. In his days Judah will be saved and the Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called. The Lord or Jehovah our righteousness. Um, and then Jeremiah 23, 5-6. Here's a very familiar passage in Joel 2.32, and I quote again, And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Um, end quote. Both Acts 2.21 and Romans 10.13 quote that passage applying the title of Jehovah to Christ, or the Lord to Christ. The simple fact is that Jehovah's Witnesses do not witness to the true Jehovah of Scripture. They reject his own witness and the witness of his word that Christ himself is Jehovah who came to earth in human flesh. Uh, Tron. <laughs> Remember the movie Tron? Never mind. Alright, three titles reserved for Jehovah are applied to Christ. In Isaiah 10.20 we find the expression uh, Jehovah the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One is said to be no less than Jehovah Himself. And in Acts 3.13 to 4, uh, 3.13 to 4, they don't make just sense. Hold on. 3. Yeah, 13. Peter, I don't know, Peter tells the men of Jerusalem, You delivered up Jesus and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One. End quote. In Isaiah 44, 6, we read, Thus says Jehovah, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, Jehovah Sabaoth, or Sabaoth, I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. That verse, in and of itself, offers strong proof for the Trinity, 
because it differentiates between Jehovah and his Redeemer, Jehovah. But it also reserves for Jehovah God this expression, the first and the last. That title surfaces again in Revelation 1.8, where it is again applied to Jehovah, and in quote, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There's no question about who owns that title. Notice, too, that it is a title that can hardly be shared with any created being, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Yet at the end of the book of Revelations, we read these words again, this time spoken by Jesus Christ. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22:13. So in Isaiah 43, 11, God speaks, and I quote, I, even I, am Jehovah, and there is no other Savior besides me. End quote. Did you realize the title Savior is reserved in Scripture for God? This verse says so in the plainest possible terms. And I quote, I am Jehovah and there is no Savior besides me. That is why Paul, writing to Titus, did not shrink from applying the name God and the word Savior both to Jesus Christ. In Titus 2.11-2.13 uh, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now in Zechariah 12.10, includes the most interesting prophecy in context. This is Jehovah speaking. Verse 4 tells us so. Then verse 10 says, and I quote, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. End quote. Who was the one who was pierced? It was Christ. And John 19.37 specifically applies this text to Christ. Deuteronomy 10.17 says, and I quote, Jehovah, your God, is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. End quote. Yet Revelation 17.14 applies the title Lord of lords to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. These will wage war, and I quote, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are with Him are the called and chosen and faithful. End quote. Now, during this reading, this is not just for Jehovah's Witnesses, or against Jehovah's Witnesses. There's a lot of people out there, uh, even Catholics, that... Uh, will argue with you and say, well, Jesus wasn't God. Jesus wasn't the Father. Jesus wasn't the Son. I mean, Jesus was just the Son, or whatever. And I've actually made another video uh, in regards to this as separate from the word game, just in context of all the times that Jesus said Him and the Father are one. Uh, and I quote tons of scripture in that to those points too, of which none of that scripture has been men mentioned here as, as of yet. But uh, let us go on, because it may yet still be some of it. Um, Jesus possesses all the incommunicable attributes of God. Christ is eternal, as we noted in Micah 5.2, in his titles, the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. He is omnipresent. In Matthew 18.20, he said, uh, and I quote, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. And in Matthew 28, 20, he promised, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. End quote. He is omnis omniscient, uh, or omniscient. Uh, on the night Christ was betrayed, his disciples told him, and I Quote, now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. End quote. And I, that was part of what I wrote and said in that one video too, was how he knew in advance before they even questioned, 
before they even voiced their concerns, questions, or doubts, uh, Jesus brought it up to them first because he already knew what they were going to say. Um, and so John, uh, John 16.30, later Peter appealed to Christ's omniscience, omniscience uh, in his own defense. And John 21.17, I quote, Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. End quote. In Revelation 2.23, Christ describes himself in these terms, and I quote again, I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Okay, And this would go perfectly in with what we're talking about here, about the name game, and what I said in the uh, first version, the part one of this, about your labels and your silliness with names and thinking that... Uh, the names even make a difference in what's really going on because uh, the Lord sees beyond your words he sees beyond what defiles your mouth and the languages that we are given and the deceptions that we are uh, that are pervaded so he is omnipotent in Philippians or Philippians sorry whatever <laughs> 321 says he and I quote, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. End quote. Hebrews 1 to 3 says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now this can be attributed to a lot of different things. I want to point out now also that this is a example of the transformation power of the Lord in this construct and how just by believing in his glory and being saved and the whole point of the blood thing and the DNA thing you can change your DNA he can change everything about your life he can make things happen in your life that you thought were impossible because he has total power over this construct and if it helps you to envision this Think of a master programmer, okay, who is running a live, uh, artificially intelligenced construct, say, in like a video game. And so, is all he has to do is get on his computer, you know, on his little computer keyboard, and if he wants to change something about a certain character in the game, he goes straight to the code, and he punches in, okay, and boom manifestly that character is now changed he can change a non-playable character into a playable character he can change a playable character into a non-playable character okay this is just a you know a metaphorical or analogical answer to the question of, of the power and and you know i can i can profess to this myself because i've seen I have seen, <laughs> I've seen things you people wouldn't even freaking believe if I told you. So anyway, uh, that aside, he is immutable, unchanging. His attribute could never be true of any created being. And that's in uh, Hebrews, uh, or okay, he is immutable, unchanging. His attribute could never be true of any created being. He's outside of creation. Okay. Um, yet Hebrews 1 10 12 speaking of Christ thou Lord in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands they will perish but thou remainest and they will all become old as a garment and as a mantle thou wilt roll them up as a garment they will also be changed but thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. Hebrews 13.8 is a familiar affirmation of the immutability of Christ. And I quote, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. End quote. In summary, scripture says Christ embodies every attribute that is true of Jehovah. 
uh, Colossians uh, 2 9, and I quote, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. End quote. And Hebrews 1 3 says, Christ is the radiance of the Lord's glory, or Jehovah's glory, and the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is Jehovah God, or the Lord God. <coughs> I mean, whenever you hear those words, that's all you got to replace it with. That, you know, just again, they're not proper names. Adonai, uh, Jehovah, Yahweh. These are all just, they mean the Lord, period. The Lord God. Um, because nobody knows his name. Bottom line. And that's what it comes down to. And, you know, some could speculate that uh, if he even told his name Moses on the, plant, on the, on the mount, up on the Mount Sinai when he gave him the commandments. Uh, from my understanding, he didn't even tell Moses what his name was. And uh, there could be very good cause for that, because even in this world, even in this construct, to know somebody's name is to hold power over that person. It seriously is. It applies in not only uh, uh, the constructive energy world, as uh, used in magic or the occult, um, in spell casting, it is also used in our law. When the cop asks you your name, you're giving him consent and power when you give your name. Our names are used against us in the Admiral Time Courts under the straw man, which is a false identity, but most people don't know that, so therefore they consent to that name being used as their personal identification. Uh, it's all built around the same concept. So the fact that the Lord, Creator God, may have never given man his real complete name is wouldn't surprise me a bit. <laughs> and is probably most likely. Even the uh, what he said to Moses was uh, I am what I who I am. Period. And that's not a name. That's saying you know, I am who I am. I am I. Period. Uh, so again, we do not have, and may never have had, the Lord, Creator God, Father, real name. That's the, the word I use, the same word Jesus used, and that's Father. So, and let's go on. Okay, five, Jesus does the works of God. Jesus does works that God alone can do. For example, Christ created all things. John 1 3 says, and I quote, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. If that is true, then he himself could not be a created being. Again, he's the he's the computer, he's the code master. He's outside the construct. Created this construct. And and when I say construct, I mean it is a construct. It is a matrix, folks. We actually have scientific knowledge proving this in quantum physics now. We know that everything is made up of energy and that basically our senses are simply uh, decoding that energy or undecoding it, however you want, you know, uh, deciphering that energy into what we know as sight, sound, touch, feel, this. They're nothing but like, uh, yeah, they're, they're electronic impulses, period. Um, we live in a holographic world. We live in a holographic universe. It's nothing but a hologram made up of energy vibrating at different frequencies. Period. And then, and anybody who's gotten into it that far and knows this, other than even just scientifically knowledge, I myself have experienced it. Like I've said, I've, I've, I've seen it all disappear and reappear right before my very eyes. Literally, in the blink of an eye, uh, I've seen amazing supernatural things, and uh, so I mean, I I'm I'm not a believer. I know I, I'm a knower. I I have the gnosis, but uh, even if you didn't have those experiences, our science nowadays through quantum physics has proven that. 
So, I digress. Col uh, Colossians uh, 1 6 says the same thing in more detail, ruling out the possibility he could have be any kind of archangel. And I uh, quote again, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. End quote. Verse 17 takes it a step further, and the picture is him not only as creator, but also as the sustainer. And uh, I quote again, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. End quote. And notice it doesn't say by him, in him. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm not going to the dissertation on that. You should be able to figure that one out. He oversees the operation of divine providence. In John 17:2, Christ prays to the Father. And I quote again, even as thou gavest the Son authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. Ephesians 1.22 echoes that, and it says, and I quote, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church. End quote. <laughs> head and feet and head. Head and feet. <clears throat> he forgives sin. This was a huge controversy in Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew 9 to 2 to 7 and Mark 2 5 to 10 gives the accounts of how the Pharisees were offended that he forgave sins. In Mark 2 7 they ask, and I quote, Why does this man speak that way? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? End quote. They understood clearly the implications of his authority. He has the power to raise the dead and judge final judgment. In John 5.22, Jesus said, and I quote, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. End quote. That is a very explicit claim on deity. And in verse 24, Jesus even makes the basis of judgment the issue of whether someone hears his word or not. Acts 10.42 says Christ has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. End quote. Acts 17.31 says the same thing. Second Timothy 4.1 says, Christ Jesus is to judge the living and the dead. It is He who will bring us into the fullness of glorification. Philippians uh, and 3.21 says, and I quote, He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. End quote. In Revelation 21 5 says, and I quote again, Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus receives worship. Jesus himself in Matthew 4.10 said, and or told the devil, in, and I quote, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. End quote. If Jesus himself were only a creature, he would have been guilty of hypocrisy, for he himself received worship. Not once did Jesus ever rebuke anyone for worshiping. Never did he refuse anyone's worship. In fact, he corrected those who scolded others for worshiping him, as in John 10. When Martha was angry that Mary sat at his feet, and in Matthew 26 he rebuked the disciples, the disciples for being indignant uh, as the woman that anointed him with the expensive ointment, or the oil. Listen carefully to these verses and remember that in every case, Jesus welcomed the worship that was offered to him. Matthew 14.33, I quote, And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son, end quote. John 9.38 And the man born blind said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Matthew 8.9 uh, And behold, and I quote, And behold, Jesus met them, greeted the women coming from his tomb, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. End quote. Matthew 28.17-18 
and quote and when the eleven disciples saw him they worshiped him but some were doubtful and jesus came up and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth in quote and john twenty twenty eight and twenty nine and i quote thomas answered and said to him my lord my god and now listen to Jesus' response to Thomas, calling him God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you and have you believed, blessed are they who did not see, and yet believed. End quote. So, contrast Jesus' response to worship with Peter's response when Cornelius met him, and fell at his feet and worshipped him. Acts 10.25 Verse 26 says, Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. End quote. Acts 14, uh, 11 to 18, tells of a similar episode in Paul's ministry when he and Barnabas refused to worship of an entire crowd. Then, in Revelation 9 to 10, or 9 10 and 22 8 to 9, we have angels refusing to worship from the Apostle John. In 22 9, the angel says, and I quote, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. End quote. Scripture explicitly states that the Son of God is to be worshipped. Uh, John 5, 23 says, and I quote, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. End quote. Jesus placed himself on the highest possible level when he made himself an object of our faith. John 14, 1, and I quote, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. End quote. You will want ultimate proof that Jesus is not an angel. Hebrews, or you want ultimate proof that Jesus is not an angel? That's a question. Hebrews 1 to 6 says that when the Father brought the Son into the world, he said, and I quote, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay, now let's move on to the two final lines of argument that prove Jesus is God. I have saved the strongest for last. For if Jesus is God, you would expect the Bible to say so in the strongest of terms, and in fact, it does. And I might point out at this point that that was also. Uh, the fallen angels and and Satan, uh, that was what they refused to do, to my understanding. Um, and that's why they were fallen. Other than the sin of pride, you know, uh, all that. I mean, I, I imagine each angel had their own <laughs> uh, problems. <laughs> But that was like one of the major ones that got them out of grace. Um, Alright, the Bible says Jesus is God. Uh, part 7. And uh, John 1 is a favorite text of Jehovah's Witnesses. The people who come to your door are thoroughly trained in how to respond if you show them. John 1, 1. Turn to that passage and let's look at the first three verses. In the beginning, the Word was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. This is a very strong statement on the deity of Christ. Every phrase is significant. In the beginning, harks back to Genesis 1 1, and says the beginning of John's Gospel in eternity in the past. Um, before anything or anyone was created, B.B. Warfield wrote, What is declared that in the beginning, not from the beginning, but in the beginning, when first things came to be, the Word not came into being so that He might be the first of those things which came into being, but already was. Absolute eternity of being is asserted for the word is as precise and strong language as absolute eternity of being can be asserted. The word antedates the beginning of things. He already was. 
in the next phrase, the Word was with God. Only strengthens the assertion of deity in this passage. It means that from all eternity, the Word coexisted with God, alongside with Him, in a personal intercommunion with Him. In Warfield's words, and I quote, He has been from all eternity God's fellow. This eternal relationship between God and the Word is uncored, or underscored by a phrase in John 1, 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. End quote. The only begotten Son who is the bosom of the Father. Jesus Christ was eternally in the bosom of the Father. Somehow distinct from God, yet at the same time identical to Him. By the way, the New American Standard translation in verse 18 is accurate. In the Greek, the literal wording is the only begotten Son, or only begotten God. An, another straightforward proof of Christ, Christ's deity. The whole principle of the Trinity is wrapped up in this expression, the Word was with God. But let's return to the third phrase John, in John 1, 1, for this is part uh, the part Jehovah's Witnesses feel they can answer. And I quote, the word was God. That is precisely and literally what this text says in Greek. A well-trained J.W. will attempt, or Jehovah's Witness, will attempt to convince you that our translation is faulty. In the Greek, they will tell you the word lacks any definite article. Quite right. Therefore, they say an indefinite article must be supplied. And I quote, the word was a god. That is bad Greek, <laughs> and totally unwarranted. Was is what is known as a copulative ner verb. Nerve, <laughs> verb. You may have called it a linking verb in grammar school. It simply connects a noun on one side with a noun on the other. The word was God. God, in that sentence, is a pre predicate nominative. It can only be translated the way you find it in most Bibles. The word was God. To insert the word A is both bad Greek and bad grammar in any language. Jehovah's Witnesses have produced their own Bible with their own translation, and they have a handful of Greek scholars who have tried desperately to defend this translation. But what these JW scholars do not tell their own people is that there are dozens of places in their Bible where they are forced by common sense to violate the very rule they want to try to impose on John 1.1. I'll give you two examples from this very same context. If we followed the JW construction and added a word, A every time the definite article is missing. Here's how a couple of other verses from John 1 would read. Verse 6, there came a man sent from a God whose name was John. <laughs> and verse 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of a God, even to those who believed in his name. So John 1.1 1, 1 is the Achilles heel of the Jehovah's Witness theology. And that is why every Jehovah's Witness is taught to say when it is brought up. But their answers are not all satisfying to anyone who knows the smallest amount of Greek grammar, and their denial of Christ's deity is easily debunked merely by the context of this verse. You needn't be shaken by the JW arguments on this. Now, the rest of this, you know, this, this is kind of a smasher on Jehovah's Witnesses. Um... Jesus, we're going to skip all that because I'm not going to argue and I'm not really here to out the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is not what this is about. Um, yeah, they're, you know, they are what they are. We, we know what they are. We know that basically all churches nowadays are one form of a cult or another. Okay. Um, Jesus himself told us that. Okay, even because it was the same back in his day. Um, so we'll not get into that uh, church bashing or cult bashing. We're just here to make a point of Jesus himself claims to be God. Finally, if Jesus is God, we might expect him to say so. 
Have you ever wondered why he didn't simply state, I am God, and put an end to any possibility of confusion? Well, actually he did. What he says in John 8:58 was to his Jewish audience a far more explicit statement than if he had merely said, I am God. It is important to see this passage in its context. In verse 53, we see that the Pharisees were becoming uncomfortable with Jesus' claims, beginning to suspect that he was putting himself on a level of authority no mere man would have any right to. And they said, and this is, see, this is the part where they tried to trap him up. <coughs> and it starts with the, the verse 53 in John 8. Uh, it says, Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. <laughs> therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Um... Notice that these men understood precisely what he was saying. And because he obviously also understood what they were asking, his reply is all that much more significant. He was telling them he was God, using the name Jehovah himself had revealed to Moses at the burning bush, I am. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? I noticed it when I read it. He could have made no stronger claim of deity. If that had not been his meaning, if he were claiming only to be the firstborn angel, he would have said, Before Abraham was born, I was. The Gospel of John includes a whole series of statements Jesus made about himself using this name, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Each one of these statements studied in context reveals that he was making claim after claim of absolute deity. The biblical evidence for the deity of Christ is conclusive, and it is overwhelming, irrefutable evidence. In fact, that we have covered here is only a representative example. I haven't even mentioned John 10.30, I and the Father are one. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier, uh, and because I, there's a lot of places where he talks about him and the Father are one. Um, many places in scripture and I, I included those in a previous video I had made uh, and that video was actually a video I made in contest of uh, the corruption of the Bible where in two chapters uh, the translators tried to say that when he was hanging on the cross he said oh father why how I have thou uh, forsaken me of which uh, I proved through the scriptures and not only showing that he knew what he was there to do he knew what he had to go through to do it and uh, he knew previous you know to thoughts of the, his disciples to everyone uh, what they were going to say what the questions were he, uh, on top of that he and the father were one so why would he sit there and say why have thou art forsaken me? There's only one chapter that actually gets it correct, and that's in Luke. And Luke's rendition of it is the correct rendition of what he says uh, when he says those words that nobody understood. And that was when he was uh, basically giving his soul back into the one, back to the Father. And uh, from the earthly earthly form and he said it right before he died those were his last words and then he died and then the temple rent and uh, the power of his transformation uh, from one state and one dimension to the other uh, was what rent the temple and and basically you know called down the power uh, or called forth the power and Luke is the only chapter that gets it right 
um, for some reason they corrupted it and then a lot of people tried to take it back to the Psalm 22 and connect that and there's not even the same thing uh, the Psalm 22 was was uh, I think it was David in the desert and he was crying out oh why father father why have you forsaken me uh, and for some reason they want to connect that to Jesus hanging on the cross when they were completely different time frames completely different people um, you know but they confuse people in the scriptures by saying that and there's actually a lot of places all throughout the scripture that are corrupted but you that's why Jesus spoke in parables when he did uh, so that the translators couldn't even change them or the true meaning of them uh, there's a lot you know you can still discern the truth even out of all the corruptness that's in there and it has been corrupted um, you know and those people will pay their penance there's there's word on there about the people who tried to uh, corrupt the word and uh, their judgment you know uh, vengeance is his and, and I won't even speculate where they're at now <laughs> or or where they're gonna be so anyway, I and the Father are one. That and many other similar passages could be adduced to prove even more conclusively that according to Scripture, He is God. And so much evidence cannot be swept aside or ignored. You either believe it or you condemn yourself to unthinkable eternity. In fact, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. Period. There, Jesus holds forth this, His, I am without predicate as the object of our faith he is very obviously setting himself in the place of God and he can do that only because he is God those who know that scripture is the word of God can only believe and join in the worship of him at whose name every knee shall bow and every knee shall bow because he has judgment when you die and with that article, and I want to know, okay. we will move on to this point of this. And we got names of God, and we've got the names of God in Judaism. Now, um, the numerous names for God have been a source of debate among biblical scholars. Scholars, Elohim, God or authority in plural form. El, meaning mighty one. El Shaddai, meaning almighty. Adonai, meaning master or lord. Elion, the highest. Avinu, or Avinu, our father, are regarded by many religious Jews, not as names, but as titles highlighting different aspects of Yahweh and the various roles of God. Okay, and remember, Yahweh is the tetragrammaton. Okay, the just the spelling because it's, it's we pronounce it Yahweh, okay, but it's these letters, and however they were pronounced in, uh, you know, Hebrew, we'll never know because the Hebrews are too superstitious to pronounce it, <laughs> for fear of breaking the uh, you know taking the name in vain. Which uh, I'm not worried about it in my discussion here because I'm not taking it in vain. I'm not blaspheming the name. We are simply defining the name. Okay, and even that name is not the name. That is another descriptive term or title. However, other Jewish sources accept the fact that there are various names of God used in the Hebrew Bible, and that Elohim is a plural word. Word. World. A word uh, may <laughs> that's funny anyway um, may suggest a polytheistic origin thus the ancient rabbis went to great lengths to try to account for the number of names of God by claiming that they account for the various aspects of God and this is Jews you know this is Jewish in Jewish tradition the sacredness of the divine name or titles must be recognized by the professional suffer or scribe who writes Torah scrolls or Tepelin and mezuzah 
uh, before transcribing any of the divine titles or name, he prepares mentally to sanctify them. Once he begins, he does not stop until it is finished, and he must not be interrupted while writing it. If an error is made in writing it, may not it may not be erased, but a line must be drawn round it to show that it is cancelled, and the whole page must be put in Genesi, a burial place for scripture, and a new page begun. Then see how superstitious these people are, <laughs> and that's what it, that's I mean, that's what it boils down to: superstition on on that part on on these rituals and these uh, because you know there's there's a there's a thing there's a good healthy fear of the Lord okay the Lord Creator the Father, um, that I mean. It, how do I put this? It's healthy. As when when they say fear the Lord, they don't mean fear the Lord is in fear and trembling. Uh, I mean of His wrath that is just going to blindly strike you down for no reason. Okay, fear the Lord because, like I said, He's the one on the keyboard, man. He's the one who created everything, and so. It's a healthy fear. It's like if it's it's a fear out of respect. Uh, you've heard it said that uh, you know if you want respect, and that's what a lot of men try to duplicate, is respect through fear. Uh, and uh, it's a it's so that's what the it should say respect the Lord, but see, people don't respect the word respect. See, they don't understand what respect is. Most people don't. And so it said, fear the Lord. Because, I mean, you know, with one keystroke, psh, you're, you're history, dude. Bottom line. I mean, you really. So you want to be pleasing to the Lord. Um, and you want to try to do what's right in His eyes. Not what's right in your eyes. Because not always what's right in our eyes is what's right in His eyes. Um, and many of the people that we would think aren't doing right in his eyes are actually doing right in his eyes because he uses them for those purposes. Whatever they may be, we may see it as evil, but we don't know the mysterious works of the Lord. And throughout history, it's actually written in the Bible many places. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is the best example I can think of where the Lord, or even Cain for that matter, um, you know, the Lord gives a certain grace and uh, certain powers to these individuals. And uh, then they make their choices, you know. And these people like Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he just, he, he took it and ran with it. He thought, oh, I got the Lord's blessing to be a tyrant. And he went on to be a tyrant. But then his day came. <laughs> and, and the Lord said, well, okay, you decided you're just going to, take advantage of me, I give you an inch and, and you, you take a mile and so, you know, here you go slash <laughs> whoops I must have hit the wrong key well, anyway um, we're not getting into this a whole lot, here we'll read a little bit the name of God in Judaism most often used in the Hebrew Bible is the four letter name YHWH as we know it is also known as the Tetragrammaton Tetragrammaton appears, you know, this many times in the Hebrew and in, in the uh, edition of the Masoretic text uh, is first mentioned in Genesis 2 4. It's traditionally translated as the Lord in English language Bibles. Hebrews letters are right to left. It's Yah He Wav He or Yahweh Yahweh or Yahweh. Yehovah, and it is written as YHWH or YHVH or JHVH in English, depending on the transliteration convention that is used. Um, YHWH is the archaic third person singular imperfect of the verb to be, meaning therefore he is. This interpretation agrees with the meaning of the name given in Exodus, where God is represented as speaking in hints as using the first person, I am. It stems from the rabbinic conception of monotheism that God exists by himself for 
uh, for himself, or I would say by himself, of himself, and is un the uncreated creator who is independent of any concept, force, or entity. I am that I am. Um, and a lot of this we've already gone over in the other descriptions, so we're just going to kind of skip that. I just want to go over the names of God in Judaism, has these different references and these different things, and it admits that they are all just titles. None of them are the actual proper name uh, of the Lord. And you can actually go on here, they have, if you want to hear it pronounced, you can play the clips. I think I had another page that was really good for that. Let me see if I can find it. This is the New Advent, New Catholic Encyclopedia. Um, come on. Uh, we're going to go to Jesus in a minute, but actually we're going to go to Yeshua first, then Jesus. There it is. Hebrew names of God. Uh, and this page goes on, and actually, once it loads, you may have to load it, but it's uh, www.hebrewforchristians.com. Names of, and they don't even spell it out, <laughs> this G D Yeshua slash Yeshua HTML. Uh, yeah, I'll leave this on here for a second. You can see this address right here on the screen and copy it down if you want to go here and uh, get off the screen okay so you can go to this page and it has all the Hebrew names of God the sons of God or the son of God as revealed in the Brit Chadash uh, or Chadasha and uh, it actually has little speakers here that you can click on so you can hear the Hebrew pronunciation of these words you have uh, this page surveys a plethora of Hebrew names and titles for the God, the Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, as found in the Brit Shadadasha. And they are listed in alphabetical order with the Hebrew spelling, common transliteration, and English phonetics following. For each name, I include some scriptural references. Um, and this whole site is like a learn Hebrew site. Right here, you can go to home. It's got grammar, blessings, prayers, scriptures, life cycles, holidays, meditations, etc. It's a really good site. Um, but this particular page goes to the words. It gives you the name. gives you the, what it means. The uh, Hebrew. And you can actually, you know, the English spelling, the Hebrew written. And then you can actually push on the speaker if you want to hear it spoken. Um and it goes in through all, you know, all these different writings in the uh, Rashid Riyadh Elohim Ha Elohim uh, Yadid. Um, you know, it, it's it spells them out. It's a really good site. Check it out. Um, I don't know how long we've been talking here. Almost about an hour and forty-five minutes, probably already. Uh, there's Christ. Hamashiach, Hamashiach, the Anointed, the Messiah, occurs over 500 times in the Brit Chadadasha, the Christ, or in Kinoan Greek, it is spelled like that. Um, and I, I think in the first chapter I said something about Jesus in the Latin, and I get the uh, the subject. And the uh, Voltev, Voltev, uh confused sometimes. But so Jesus is the Greek uh, from the Greek for uh, Yeshua, which was originally the Hebrew was Yeshua. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this part two right now, and in part three we'll come back with Yeshua, the name or Yeshua. And, uh, and, uh, or Yeshua, Yeshua, or Yehoshua, I mean Joshua. It's all just Joshua, basically, is all Yeshua is Joshua, because back in their day they didn't have J, of course. Um, but we'll get into all that. We'll go to there. 
We'll check out that page. We'll check out Jesus. We'll check out how Yeshua became Jesus. Um, you know, I went ahead and gave you the Hebrew name site already. Um, and we'll have some more information for you on the name and the various names and versions of them, where they come from, and definitions thereof. And I thank you for joining me. I think my voice is a little dry. It's time to drink some cream soda and coffee. And uh, <laughs> uh, blessings to you all.